Chapter 27. Our second mission to the Philippines. Our first mission to the Philippines was, was very successful, and we visited prisons in Angeles City and at Longa Po cities, preaching the gospel to many prison inmates. Our second mission took one year to prepare, and we took with us a team of five people from England, who were Gordon Smith, Alistair Sutherland, Andy MacDonald, Catherine Farr, and Dr. Richard Kent. On this mission, we visited Baguio City Jail, Benguet District Jail, and New Bilibid Prison. In New Bilibid Prison, there were over 13,000 inmates, and 1,200 inmates on death row. It was during our first mission, Michael and I invited 100 men from New Bilibid Prison who had turned their lives from crime to follow Jesus Christ to write their testimonies. It was during the following year, Michael collated these testimonies and sent them to me in England, and we published them in our book. 66 of these testimonies can be read in our book, Trojan Warriors. This contains testimonies of some of Asia's most notorious criminals, some gangsters, robbers, murderers and rapists, who had become Christians, 22 of which were condemned to death, incarcerated on death row. William C. Pollock was one of our Trojan warriors, and his testimony is number 63 in our book, Trojan Warriors. He had killed a policeman and had had his leg shot off during a gun run-in with the police, and now only had one leg. He was due to be released in August 2002, and Michael and I commissioned him to return to his own city in Baguio and preach the gospel in the city jail and in Benguet Provincial Jail. He did this very successfully. We funded him with a monthly allowance of, of 6,600 pesos per month, plus expenses from August to July 2003, and he did a very good job. Again, the doctrinal basis of William Pollock's work were those of the Beaton Strict of Particular Baptist, 1831, as printed in our book, Trojan Warriors. I don't wish to really talk about money, as the law provides funds for his work in his own way. However, because evil men and people who pry into other people's business, and also to silence gainsayers, for the record, both Michael and I provided all the funds for from our personal resources. And between September 2000 and May 2005, we provided all the funds for the mission to a tune of £50,000, English pounds. And on Michael's death, he left £10,000 for his daughter. We received no funds from anywhere except a gift from the Christian Church in England of £400 in July 2001. Our Trojan Horse funds supplied all the return airfares for all the 14 members, all their accommodation expenses and travelling arrangements for the 2002 mission. The mission was paid for by Michael and I, the directors of Trojan Horse. We had no funds from anywhere else, and we did not seek sponsorship. The accounts of our Trojan horse are available upon request. It was during this second mission to the Philippines that we had some serious difficulties, and I received some serious news from England. The first blow was I got news of my wife's divorce petition, and as a result, I felt it right to remain in the Philippines rather than return to England and deal with all the evil, hurtful side of a divorce. I decided that I would be better off to bring further assistance to Michael and complete the work that we had begun. Without going into too much detail, we encountered remarkable opposition on this mission and a lot of obstacles were presented to us in the form of serious life issues, issues that would affect anyone involved in the ministry who are seeking to preach the gospel and issues that affect all classes of men. It was almost as though someone was deliberately seeking to put a stop to all the work we were doing. On every hand we hit difficulties, and hurt, and opposition, issues that I felt compelled to record and write about. This I have done in our book, Before the Cock Grows. 1. The first serious issue was facing that of a messy separation of our hosts. Our host was a Christian mission, a man and wife team, who had sadly separated six months before we arrived. One had levelled a charge of adultery against their partner. Then we did the best we could to help. I was faced with a serious threat of deportation from the offended partner when our team when our team had returned to the UK. The problem deteriorated and non-scriptural actions were employed to sort things out that led to serious injustice. 2. 
a Filipino member of the team was being challenged and condemned for working with Trojan Horse, and it was rumoured we were a fake organisation. This particular religious volunteer, or RBO it's called, also felt it wrong to drink wine or sing secular songs. And he took offence when he heard I had not only drunk wine, but had mixed with sinners and sang songs with them late at night in the prison. He felt threatened and said it was a serious problem. It was no problem to me, as that was a ministry that I had received from the Lord, but as a result of my actions, spread by rumours all around the prison. This RVO felt threatened by my actions, and he did not wish to associate with a mission whose director drank wine, mixed with sinners, late at night whilst in prison. So that was the problem, but it posed a real problem to him. My view was that we were a Christian mission, where we sought to reach men in whatever state they were, to inform them that the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. We were not there in the Philippines or in its jails to support false religion or bow down to idols set up by the minds of the religious. 3. There were differences of opinion as to how we should conduct preaching or ministry, and with hindsight this was due to the various differences in doctrinal beliefs and practice. Michael and I believed in the sovereignty of God, and that through sharing, speaking, communication, and preaching the gospel, men would be saved. This could be done in various ways. Some team members felt we should take every opportunity when we had crowds listening to launch out into Billy Graham type appeals for men to come forward and be saved. It was because Michael did not go along with that route that some team members murmured saying that we had missed a great opportunity. 4. Our Trojan Horse International, CM Ministry, had not been registered by Lucas Dungatton with the Security Exchange Commission and this was required to work in the prison which proved awkward since we had enemies and they sought to use this against us, seeking to deny our existence and get us banned from the prison. 5. The RVO that took exception to me drinking wine had also been responsible to register our incorporation. Once I discovered Luca Dungatton had not done so with the Security Exchange Commission, the leader of Sunlight Ministries then warned this RVO that Trojan Horse did not exist and we were a bogus organisation and a warning was issued to him to stay clear of us. 6. The next rumours that were spread were that the Catholic Church in the Philippines had banned our book Trojan Warriors and so we should be avoided. 7. It was then rumoured that Michael and I had received money by way of sponsorship to the tune of $4 million from America. 8. The next wind of half-truths came with a gale, and they were straightforward lies. It was spread around the prison that I had left my wife and daughter in the UK, was selling our family home, had a Filipino girlfriend, and that I was a drunkard and had drinking sprees in the prison. 9. Then came a more sinister blow, which really hurt me personally, when I learned that Lucas had not registered our Trojan Horse Ministry with the Securities Exchange Commission, and that the RBO that I mentioned had not completed the task, even though Lucas had been given the money to get the job done in January 2002. I insisted it be done immediately. It then turned out that this particular RBO had removed Gordon, Alistair and our names from being directors of the incorporation, which meant only those remaining Filipinos had the legal right in the affairs of this ministry. It was being placed in the hands of Lucas and his Filipino men. To add to this, listen to the next incriminating thing. 10. To resolve the problem, I insisted that Lucas P. Dangatton return from his bank account the remaining Trojan horse funds that I had personally given him, which amounted to 1.5 million pesos at the beginning of the mission in 2002. He had had already 600,000 pesos for the registration of the ministry. When I asked for the remainder of the money, once I realised our ministry was not registered, Lucas returned 1.1 million pesos on the 6th of December 2002. That meant we had spent 400,000 pesos on the mission since September 2002 to December 2002. 11. It was four days after this that Lucas P. Dangatton ordered his men in New Bilibet Prison Theological Institute to write a petition against Michael and I and the Trojan Horse seeking to deny our existence 
and have us banned from the prison. The whole matter is recorded in our book Before the Cock Crows. 12. The sad thing was that the news of this affair was reported back to England via Lucas and Garney using emails along with miscorrespondence from my estranged wife to the UK. As a result, Gordon and Alistair, the elders of the Church of the Christian Gospel Church in Portsmouth, withdrew from me and it was stated that, in their opinion, I should withdraw from the work that we were engaged in and return to England. To cut it short, those things that militated against us were all the result of so-called religious men who were governed by their natural fallen man's actions, which were gossip, lies, slander, jealousy, rumours, greed, money, a denial of truth, opposition to the truth, Arminian righteousness, ignorance and blindness. So, due to the opposition that we experienced from within New Berlin Prison, I felt it right, the right thing to do, to register our ministry with the Security Exchange Commission myself and with the help of a Filipino particular Baptist pastor, I did so. It was on the 16th of January, 2003, that I met a particular Baptist pastor, Ronaldo Lopez, at the internet office in Montelupa City, and we shared our experiences. He stepped in and assisted me in many ways, and for which I'm very thankful to this day. I noted the day, as this was exactly 23 years to the day of my conversion from Christ to Christ, with Ronaldo's assistance, I registered our Trojan Horse International Tulip Fills Incorporated Ministry with the Security Exchange Commission, SEC Commission Building, EDSA, Green Hills, Mundalu, Yong City. In order to fulfil our mission and undertaking to help many inmates who had believed the Gospel, we returned on a second mission, October 2003. However, we faced trouble which meant I had to secure a full-time visa permit to continue my stay in the Philippines and the mission work in the jails. It came with surprising clarity that the show of religious zeal, which was apparent everywhere in the Philippines, was deceptive, as underneath it all there was found every evil work, in a similar way to my observations and experience that I'd seen in the Bitten Church those many years ago. It was just another face. In the Beerton situation, the evils were more sophisticated, but in the Philippines, they were more blatant. I concluded that the Arminian righteousness and the righteousness that men have through their adherence to the law of Moses or their own traditions were one and the same thing, a fair show in the flesh. This is not the righteousness of God or Christian righteousness that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ brought about. I concluded that men may begin well by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation, but then fall from grace into making themselves perfect according to the flesh, according to religious traditions of men. They then persecute those who do not go along with them. It was, as depicted in the Apocalypse, those religious people were governed by a deceptive, unclean spirit, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. And I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. The spirit of the mother of harlots, Mystery Babylon, was governing these men in the Philippines. Revelations 17, verse 5 to 6. I came to the conclusion that when we decide to do things our own way, and not be directed by what Scripture says, we leave ourselves open to, to be the cause of another person's hurt and distress. This leads to an opening for the devil to work, and so we oppose the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was for this reason the idea to found being a particular Baptist college was considered, and is now open to students wishing to study the doctrines of grace.